Hello and welcome to the MMQV Monday Morning NFL Podcast. I'm Gary Grandling. I'm Jenny Brentis. And I'm Connor Orr. And we have a lot to get to in this show. We have the the beauty of that Chargers-Browns game, the uh, not-as-beautiful uh, Cardinals 49ers game. We got uh, Urban Meyer and his super weird challenge, the uh, Texans' bizarre special teams. Uh, lots of fun stuff coming up, but we are starting it with the Sunday night game, which some of you might have, I don't know, fallen asleep, uh, gone to bed early, missed the end of it. Yeah, like we wish we did. Uh, but yeah, we we have that, but the very first thing we have to do is, uh, we have a new addition to the show. I don't, what, what do you want to call him? Uh, he, he's a, he's a robot. Like, you know, the Fox robot. And I don't think a Fox robot has ever spoken a word, but maybe this is like the projection of the Fox robot and what his voice would sound mm. like if he was helping out on our podcast. Maybe great idea, but this this entity, whatever this might be, is going to uh, introduce the games from now on as we go through them on the Monday show. So, with that uh, unforgettable intro, let's uh, let's get it going. Bills Chiefs. <laughs> I'm not 100 percent prepared to, to say that that's a he or a she, but either way, like the the. Our new robot can be, you know, just a a wonderful, you know, genderless entity that uh, that carries us through. We're gonna need a name in some way, shape, or form. So if you'd like to send a name, you can Ooh. send it in. I'm gonna I'm gonna nominate Ira, but uh, we can mm. we can go from there. But uh, yeah, we're starting with the uh, the Bills' decisive victory over the Chiefs. Kind of there, uh, yeah, a little bit of a white whale type of a uh, victory here. Buffalo finally gets it done against Kansas City, and uh, in pretty convincing fashion. Uh, I don't know. I mean, a, a really good defensive performance. Also, just a really sloppy game from the Chiefs, which we've said a couple of times this year. Yeah, Patrick Mahomes looked a little bit off. Also, the rest of his offense looked a little bit off. So nothing was in sync. And the usual big plays that we see the Chiefs make with regularity, uh, just nothing seemed easy tonight. And it did look at certain points in time like Mahomes was trying to force it a little bit. And I think he probably knew that he had to because the defense has really been playing poorly this season. And that continues to be a storyline that because the defense is struggling, there's a lot of pressure on Mahomes to put up points. Like last week, even against the Eagles, right? He had to keep putting up points well into the fourth quarter. And this week against a much better opponent, uh, the game just spun out of reach. I think I'll stand by, you know, kind of my thought on the Chiefs from a couple of weeks ago, which is that I just I still think that the rest of the NFL is just catching up. And, you know, I, I don't think that it's necessarily an indication of uh, anything the Chiefs are doing wrong. I think it's just natural of any sort of team with like dynasty potential or whatever you want to call it now when you make two straight Super Bowls is that, you know, teams are just going to keep drafting players and, and people and all this stuff to, to defend you. And eventually this stuff is going to come full circle. And as incredible as Patrick Mahomes was, I mean, he's making throws into coverage that were designed exactly to keep him out of certain places. Um, you know, at some point you're going to find a team that has that requisite personnel to slow you down. I mean, we saw the the Bills in particular, right? I think that's four straight games now where they've had uh, one of their two safeties have an interception. Um, You know, they're just a a team that's going to be built in that way to be able to slow them down. Gregory Rousseau is a great addition there and had that batted down pass interception, but can kind of break up some of those quick throws that uh, Patrick Mahomes does to get a lot of his best skill position players involved. So I think, again, it's like it's not one of those things where you freak out and you say the blueprint exists to beat the Chiefs, but you know that it's possible on a slightly more regular basis than it was before. Yeah, it's it's not like uh, taking away Tyreek Hill is something that never uh, occurred to people over the past couple of seasons. I mean, they're they're going to see this more often than not this this sort of exaggerated two deep safety look where you absolutely do not let anything over the top come in there. But uh, I mean, right now, but look, part of the reason the Chiefs are losing games is because 
they are turning the ball over. They are giving away possessions. Uh, four, four giveaways, zero takeaways. That is the second time in three weeks they have done that. They did it against the Chargers, too. Uh, they are minus seven on the season in turnover differential. Uh, that stuff makes a difference when you are getting into these sort of, you know, tonight wasn't one possession, but if you get into a lot of one possession games and end up giving away a possession, that, uh, that makes a difference there. And also just no, no pass rush. And we know there's no Chris Jones tonight, but like, I don't know, Frank Clark, man. Uh, Frank Clark has just been a complete non-factor, which, uh, I mean, they, they gave up a, a ton of uh, draft capital. They they gave him a big contract. They, um, you know, decided they would weather, uh, you know, his his uh, past of a... Uh, domestic violence uh, allegation from from his Michigan days that uh, kept a lot of teams away from him. And right now they're just getting nothing out of the guy. Yeah, I mean, they definitely missed Chris Jones because he is such a presence up front and also because he has to be such a presence up front. And there just aren't that many good players on defense. So when you're missing one of those good players, it really makes a big impact. It does feel a little bit like, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that the Chiefs are kind that's kind of what they are, right? It's like a collection of very, very good players to elite players and then just like a and then just players. You know what I mean? It seems like the roster has grown more top heavy. Um, the you know, and I'm not blaming it on Patrick Mahomes' contract or anything, but like since the days of that second Super Bowl, the roster has kind of just grown slightly more top heavy to the point where like, I think you you have a lot of replacement level guys mixed in. And while that's every team, I think the replacement level talent there is is not as elevated maybe as some other teams. No, I think that's fair. And a guy like Daniel Sorensen, who's been around there forever, and they keep him there for that sort of comfort level. And then he gives you, a, you know, a sort of a shaky performance like he got tonight from a uh, from a safety in a game where you just <laughs> don't want to give up repeated big plays. Not that you want that to happen in any game, but especially when you're going against a really good team like uh, Buffalo. And this is my favorite part of the show when we get to say nice things about the uh, Buffalo Bills and their victory here. Uh, yeah, I mean, we saw what they did defensively. They took the ball away. Uh, they did not give up the big play. And uh, I mean, look, the one guy I want to quickly highlight offensively is Dawson Knox. Uh, he had a couple of uh, uh, long catches tonight, ends up with the uh, uh, final line was three for 117 and a touchdown here, but it's just kind of funny because the entire off season was like the Bills' quest to find a tight end. You know, they they wanted to get uh, Hunter Henry or or Jonu Smith, and then they wanted to get Zach Ertz, and maybe they were going to draft a tight end, and then they didn't get anyone, and it was kind of like this huge bummer in Western New York. And yeah, turns out Dawson Knox is is pretty good in his own right here. I had some drop problems last year, not having those issues this year, and it seems like he uh. He's built up some pretty nice chemistry with uh, Josh Allen as far as like out of structure stuff goes. Yeah, Gary, I think the emergence of Knox has been really notable. And we talked a lot about this this summer. Did the Bills add enough on offense to continue the ascent? And I think I was wrong in that I was worried that they hadn't at the, and that they might plateau a little bit. But this game really reinforced that they hadn't. I think the decisive drive... I mean, it was obviously the decisive drive in the game, but it was the most impressive one in the fourth quarter right after the Chiefs scored to cut it to 11 points. Now, yes, that drive was kept alive by a very questionable roughing the passer penalty. But just the way that they steadily moved the ball, they were able to score again. The Bills, you know, grew the their lead to 18 points, stifling out any chance of a Chiefs comeback at that point. And so I think... That was impressive in the sense that a lot of the plays were quick strike or, you know, long scores where there was some blown coverage. But to be able to have that drive at that point in the game to beat the Chiefs was really impressive. The other thing we talked about this summer was, okay, well, what pieces are they adding to get them over the hump? of last season and they ended up using their first round pick on Gregory Rousseau who had a big play tonight and would be an important addition to a pass rush that really needed one. So I think they did, you know, find ways to amplify spots that were maybe a little lacking in the season that fell a little bit short last year. 
Yeah, and they did it in this game without Matt Milano, who uh, is a guy they really miss when he's uh, missed time in the past. Uh, they they have like a thousand defensive linemen rotating in there and stayed fresh, and they uh, they kept the heat on Patrick Mahomes there. I do want to say one more thing about the officiating in this game. Uh, first of all, there there was a there was a phantom hold on the Bills that preceded the the roughing the passer penalty, but just overall in this game. The word I would describe to uh, the word I would use to describe the officiating would be insufferable. That was just uh, it, it was just ten thousand flags and like nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine of them were completely unnecessary. Uh, just breaking the flow of the game and I don't know. It it was it's a rough night for the officials. Rough weather night. Good night for the podcasters though. That's what I'm saying. You need to give, give the officials a break. They're wet. They're cranky. You know, I mean, it's just like everybody else. I mean, you know, you're sitting there saying, if I have to be here, I might as well just be a little bit active. But I, see, I like that. I mean, you know, there was a lot of like sarcasm in the broadcast about, oh, I'm not going to throw this flag. And it's like, but this is the, this is what we kind of want. I mean, it's, it's human error. There's a human element to this. And then these guys are incredible. They're making what, calls it 97% accuracy, but it's it's still up to their discretion. Maybe the Frank Clark call was a miss. I mean, I guess you could argue body weight rule slightly on that a little bit, but I don't know. I, I like having officiating sometimes twist and turn games a little bit just because it is like, <laughs> It's like an umpire in baseball. I mean, like, you know, that that's part of <laughs> part of what you have to contend with. I don't believe that for a second. I think that's that was just dripping with sarcasm. <laughs> I'm patented I, contrarian I, take. I'm, like I'm just trying to make sense of this. I was watching the playoffs today. I love that Joe West officiating these uh the these playoff games here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the I'm the son of a P one double A official, so maybe I'm just sticking oh, yeah? my neck out for the uh Maybe I'm just sticking my neck out for the guys in black and white. So you, you know, my mom was when I was a competitive swimmer. My mom was a highly trained official, so she would do a lot of big meets. And she still tells me that there's one call that she still bothers her, and she'll have a dream about it and wake it up and wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Did that swimmer miss the turn or not? And you know, so it's it's a tough job. These are things that can really stick with you. But I think you're right, Connor. I think it, they, that they probably called it for body weight with the way that I think his shoulder drove Allen into the ground a little bit. And if they're erring on the side of player safety, it's hard to argue with that, though certainly it did look like a very questionable borderline call. All right. I will lay off the officials for us for the rest of the show, but we have uh, plenty of podcasts coming up here. Browns Chargers. So this was the game of the year so far. I mean, we're five weeks in, but if you like a lot of points and you like reasonably well-scored points, it wasn't like, uh, you know, eight turnovers for each team and, and a bunch of punt return type stuff. Just two offenses playing really well against really good defenses. This is kind of the game for you. I don't have a whole lot to say about the Chargers except the fact that Justin Herbert is, I mean, we already knew it, but uh, what he did today was absolutely spectacular. Uh, he's established as like a, a you know a top five quarterback at this point, and I mean the Browns they they knocked him around a little bit. This was not like a game where uh, he got to sit back and be comfortable and and throw it around all around the field. It required like a high level of playmaking under duress, and he delivered. It's unbelievable to me how quickly Justin Herbert has ascended to this level where. He's just one of the quarterbacks that you, what's that, the scouting jargon, right, that you divide them with, uh, win with and win because of, and how quickly he's become that win because of player. And, you know, every week it's three, four touchdowns, no interceptions, uh, you know, dozens of these like perfect throws and just running the offense seamlessly at a time when, you know, a lot of us maybe expected the offense to get a little worse. We didn't really know what Joe Lombardi would bring to the table. He seemed comfortable with the coordinators that he had in the past. And so I think it's just really interesting. This is a second system. This is a second way of looking at things. And he's still just continuing this ascent that has been uninterrupted largely. Yeah, Connor, I think one of the points you made is what stands out to me the most is the ball placement and that he has a almost veteran level of knowing where to put passes so that his receiver can get them and the defender can't. And I think that's why he has had so much success in 
downs where they have to have it or, you know, in taking care of the football. It shows up in a lot of ways. And that's something that a lot of young quarterbacks struggle with or at least need to learn and get better at. But somehow he's been able to master that well beyond his experience level. They scored touchdowns on four fourth quarter drives and five of their six second half drives in a game that obviously they needed to score a lot of points in to win. And uh, as far as the Brown side of this goes, look, you know, no one in Cleveland wants to hear about moral victories at this point. But uh, I mean, the Browns have now gone into Kansas City and into L.A. And I think arguably at the least gone toe to toe with these opponents. Uh, and honestly, there, there was a there was a 33-yard fourth down pass interference flag thrown on the Browns. I kind of kind of turned this one a little bit, sort, sort of put the, the Chargers right back in it. But this was a coin flip game at best. And I think the Browns are right there. And like I said, they got heat on Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert just played an incredible game. The one counterpoint I would make to that, Gary, is that I do worry that there's a little bit of a trend showing up in which the Browns aren't able to close out games against high-level opponents. We saw it, obviously, in this game, but against the Chiefs earlier this season, and even going back to last year's playoffs against the Chiefs, right? So Mm -hmm. that seems to be the one trait that they are still working on and they had a golden opportunity when the chargers missed the extra point the browns get the ball back leading by one and just needing to sustain a drive and they had a three and out it seemed like they went a little bit conservative too they ran on two of those three plays so i think that's an interesting thing that the team needs to sort of confront. I don't exactly know. It's not something tangible, like, well, we need to work on ball security or we need to work on red zone offense. It's sort of this, you know, intangible thing that hasn't shown up. And ultimately, that's going to be what they need to figure out if they're going to either make or win the Super Bowl, as Connor has predicted. Well, yeah, that was perfect. Uh, perfect segue, Jenny. It's, you know, because I was just going to say they played like a team this week that could reach but not win the Super Bowl instead of reach and win uh, the Super Bowl. But uh, it's funny that you said that because I actually I was watching the end of one of the other games in the afternoon, and um, the sideline reporter had asked the star quarterback, "Well, what was the focus this week?" And the and the quarterback said, "Well, this week we focused on finishing, and we knew we needed to finish." But it's like just such a nebulous idea that like, did these players walk into the facility on Monday and like, there's just the word finish on the, you know, on the thing. And it's like, you know, do you like, if you have one bite of dinner left, do you like eat it really hard? And and, like, you know, do you do all these like things to like close out every aspect of your day? And that's how you prepare to finish. I don't know, but some teams do seem to be better at it for some reason than others. Well, that was the 2011 Giants, right? Wasn't that their thing? Finish? Finish. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that the word finish was plastered up over the facility to the best of my memory. Uh, That Mm -hmm. was a Tom Coughlin thing. It was reminding players to finish games. So maybe, Connor, it is as simple as that. You know, maybe it's like, like you said, you know, if you have a fumbling issue, you tote the ball around with you. You know, you're supposed to carry it high and tight. It becomes a part of your daily routine. So I really like this idea. Finish everything on your plate finish a meeting until the end, finish your reps on the bench press. I mean, this this is really good. I think, Connor, you should uh, get this idea to some people in Cleveland. We're going to scream for the, the last, like, at the end of the podcast. Gary's going to do the end credits at full <laughs> volume. It's just like that. Yeah. That's how you finish. <laughs> Listen, your previous rallying cry of beef has been extinguished. It's no longer a possibility for this season, so we've got to pivot. I think finish is the new thing. I'm okay with that. Yeah, finish is good. It's just, it's slightly off brand for us because it's 2011 Giants. I don't know. I thought we had only pulled from the 2011 Jets. (laughs) Why have I been reading all these uh, Mark Sanchez self published books? I don't know. Okay, it's possible it was the 2012 Giants and that it was like the year after. I got to look Mm. up which specific year this was and to see whether it was successful or not. But I have a very vivid memory of Tom Coughlin preaching finish my tom coughlinism was burn the boats that was my first one which was but like- also used by rex ryan connor 
Mm. We've already gone <laughs> way off topic, and it's only the second segment. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I, I think we're sort of, we're, we're rushing headlong into a really annoying, lengthy conversation about Baker Mayfield and his ability to mount drives late. I, I think you do, f you finish with offense in this league uh, in this day and age. Uh, we saw they came up empty twice at the end of the game in Kansas City. They came up empty twice mm -hmm. in this game in LA. Now, granted, you know, if, if they drove 91 seconds and scored a touchdown, uh, with no timeouts and 75 yards in this game, we, we'd be talking all about what an incredible drive it was, but it just like, you know, he, he checked down twice on the first three plays of that drive. And, you know, they basically burned 50 seconds moving the ball 10 yards to start that drive. And it's kind of like, I think it's something that can get taken care of as you move forward and you do it more often, but yeah, it's, uh, let's just, let's all prepare ourselves psychologically for a uh, super obnoxious Baker Mayfield debates in november december mm -hmm. yeah and i think gary that's a very good point is because rather than looking at it as this trend you can analyze each specific situation and in this game it was not being super aggressive in the situations when they needed to be until the very end when he heaved those three throws towards the end zone but the next to last drive, those were conservative plays, whether that was the play call or whether that was what, you know, choice he picked from an options of play calls. Those were pretty conservative. And then as you referenced early in that last gasp drive, they weren't pushing the ball downfield in the first few plays. So that's a good starting point. How do we correct it? Where is where are things going awry that aren't allowing us to move the ball like we were in other situations? Um, so that's an interesting analysis point. And yeah, I mean, Baker posted that statement on Instagram this past week about, you know, people forget how I've gotten here and I've been in this situation before. And, you know, I, I know what it's like to prove myself. And I thought that was an interesting window into the, his psyche that, you know, maybe some of the outside you know, criticism is getting to him a little bit. So I was interested to see how he played this week. And it was a great game overall until the final result. No, agreed. And he continues to be a weirdo with <laughs> basically having the rabbit ears and trying to prove himself all the time. But uh, yeah, he's a good quarterback. Just didn't play well at the end of this game and didn't play well at the end of the Chiefs game. And that's where we sit right now. Mystery Robot, what's our next game? 49ers Cardinals. <laughs> so, if Chargers-Browns was the game of the day, this was also a football game. Uh, the 49ers <laughs> and Cardinals, they, they just... Look, the Cardinals are perfect. I mean, they're they're five and zero. Oh, they they have wins over the Rams and now the 49ers. And uh, that's, that's quite a head start to be off to. But this game was just it, it was ugly it was it was a slog I mean it was you know good defense but also some not great offense here yeah this is coming from the guy who uh just a few weeks ago wrote that uh Trey Lance was going to change the way that we think about the NFL um you know first start but I might want to pump the brakes on that a little bit and I, I think it, it was just surprising to me a little bit like I thought this was all going to look a little bit more seamless than it did. I mean, you know, there were like a couple of these handoffs where you, you're basically, you're still kind of running, working out of this like loaded pistol kind of deal. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of handoffs where the running back is going to the right and you're handing off to the left. And, you know, like a lot of the unchoreographed stuff that like, yes, you would expect that from a rookie, but I just, I, I thought that there was going to be more of a plan for Trey Lance going in. And it's interesting to me that there wasn't because you knew Jimmy Garoppolo's injury history and you didn't like him already enough to trade up to draft his successor. But like, why are we all of a sudden now saying, well, this, this isn't working the way that it needs to because Jimmy Garoppolo isn't healthy, you know? And so I, I, I you know, I think I was just a little bit disappointed. I mean, there were obviously some cool moments. There was that, that power element um, to the offense is a very interesting addition, but I think right now is not nearly as effective or as dizzying for opponents as I initially had expected it to be. Yeah, the whole thing, it, it kind of looked kind of Cam Newton-ish. Uh, it, it didn't look RG3-ish. It looked kind of Cam Newton-ish with what they were doing. Uh, they clearly had given him some sort of instruction that if his first two reads were not there to, to look to take off, and 
look at there there were there were a lot of positives there were a lot of uh really nice tight window throws that he fit in uh there were things to build off of one of the things that sort of popped up a lot though was look Jimmy Garoppolo when he gets the ball out it's not always accurate but it's out like he plays on schedule he plays on time their offensive line had a lot of issues basically with with holding calls and a lot of that was was a result of not knowing where the quarterback's going to be not knowing where he's going just not having a feel for where, where he was back there and there were i mean again there were i i I don't have the number in front of me. I want to say a half dozen holding calls in this game for the 49ers offensive line, which obviously you just don't see very often. And uh, on top of that, I mean, they go one for five on fourth down. One of those came on the goal line. Um, and in a game where you lose on the road by a touchdown, those are all really big factors. Now, as as far as the Cardinals go, uh, again, this, this is a win, but it, it certainly was not as... Uh, it was not as beautiful as the one they had over the Rams a week ago. Yeah, I will say one player who has contributed a lot, a lot more than maybe we expected or, you know, maybe we didn't know when they signed J.J. Watt, would he continue to perform at a high level? He had a really great game today, and he has been an impact addition. And that wasn't to say that we thought he wouldn't be, but – their roster building philosophy was bringing in a lot of older guys. And you sort of wonder, like, at a certain point, are these players going to be able to help the way that they once did? But this was a good performance from Watt. But yeah, Gary, uh, it wasn't as dominant of a win as maybe we expected. And I got a lot of heat for keeping the Cardinals at five in the power <laughs> rankings last week. But I think part of that is because I still would like to see that they can sustain this um, because there's a lot on the quarterback and that is a tough way to win. And yes, they got another win. They're off to a five and oh start. Um, but this one was definitely more of a slog fest. It's, uh, boy, I, we, we, you can do this thought exercise with any team, but like if Greg Joseph makes that kick, uh, and the Cardinals lose in Minnesota and they're four and one are, you know, is, is anyone pumping them as, as the best team in football? Probably, probably not. Uh, and again, we, we, you know, we talk about the sustainability of this offense, uh, you know, can Kyler stay healthy doing all this sort of superhero stuff he has to do in this offense? He, look, they were, I, I don't know exactly what the injury is. Maybe we'll get some insight as the week goes on. They were clearly working on uh, some discomfort he was having in his upper throwing arm uh, as his game went on. So, uh, and, and, you know, he, he short-armed a throw to DeAndre Hopkins late in the game and ended up working out because uh, uh, it was one of those accidental underthrow completions. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It... it <sighs> 5-0 and is a good place to be. 2-0 in the division is a good place to be. Uh, Russell Wilson's out. Geno Smith's playing for a while. Cardinals are in good position, but uh, it just still, you can't shake that they're kind of heading down the same road that they were a year ago, or at least I can't. Maybe that's my problem. I think the difference is, and like, while we had initially, or I, I guess, had like, loudly pan the idea that like you know if you're gonna be air raid you need to go all in on the weapons and i think i kind of did underestimate probably a little bit the upgrades that they did make like rondell moore and then aj green on its surface mm. was not going out and getting kenny galladay or drafting one of the you know five the big five wide receivers or going you know Kadarius tony or something like that in the draft but i think what you did was actually you know kind of responsible i mean you know you did need help on that defense the defense is playing much better and you know getting vance joseph something to work with there i think is a valuable thing and they are just a matchup issue right now i mean if you look at some of the teams that are trying to spread out with them especially i don't know what it is this year but there seems like there's just some sort of a like widespread cornerback shortage and i think that you're outplaying these teams just by virtue of being uncoverable right now and so i think they did a nice job of that initially i kind of poo-pooed their ability to do so. But I do think that, you know, even by virtue of getting someone like Rondell Moore, you know, that was just enough to push them over the edge for right now. There aren't teams with a cornerback roster that's deep enough, I think, to contend with them right now. There's a whole lot of Josh Norman on DeAndre Hopkins. Mm. And that's uh that's problematic. It's, D'Amico it's Ryan great. look, D'Amico Ryan's called a great game. Seventeen points, five point one yards per play, but uh boy, when it counted DeAndre Hopkins and Josh Norman going mano a mano is not what uh, 
what you want. But uh, I think what we want is a real classic rivalry right now. <laughs> Giants Cowboys. There we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, I don't know. This was, I was intrigued by this matchup. I thought it might have been interesting. And then by the second half of the game, it was, you know, it was, it was like a preseason rotation for the Giants. You got Mike Glennon, you got John Ross in there, CJ Board, uh, lots of Royce Freeman, or no, Deontay Booker is the guy they have, ex-Broncos running backs. I'm sorry to confuse them, but yeah. Cowboys pretty much uh, uh, run away with this one, both figuratively and literally, and uh, not much of a game here. Yeah, I would have been really interested to see a full game with the Giants' full offensive roster. The number of injuries that they sustained was remarkable, and the moment with Daniel Jones was really scary, where he was staggering on the field and you know yeah. had to be um, kind of... He obviously was taken off the field later, but he was being supported by members of the medical staff after he was kind of stumbling. Um, that was a really difficult moment and um, just one of the perpetual reminders of how dangerous the game is. Well, yeah, and, you know, Daniel Jones being out, um, Saquon Barkley um, being injured again. You know, I, I think that the Giants are beyond the point where they can stop blaming um, their offensive woes or their inability to get the ball moving on Saquon not being on the field. You know, I think that we've sort of proven that that's not necessarily why everything is, is sputtering, but it, it's, it's a bad, it's a, it's a bad state of affairs right now. I mean, I think, you know, a couple of the giants beat writers had posted their opening day roster and uh, their opening day starters. And I think only Kyle Rudolph at this point is still like active and in the lineup at that point. And so it's hard to function that way. Uh, but at the same time, it's, you know, I, I don't know how much longer they're going to get to prove that this iteration of the Giants works, this philosophy, this everything that they have works, because as well as Daniel Jones has played, that seems to be in isolation of everything else around him. Yeah, they, uh, they obviously came into this one, no Sterling Shepard, and, uh, you know, uh... As this game went on, they they lose Daniel Jones to what appears to be a concussion late in the first half. They lost Kenny Galladay in the first half. They lost Saquon Barkley to an ankle injury in the first half, and uh, it just yeah, it it was a it was a mess by the time the second half rolled around. As far as the Cowboys go, I mean they look they they won this game in the style that they want to win games, which was a, a whole lot of rushing yards. Uh, you know, basically staying on the field for a long time and. Uh, you know their defense is, is more than enough to take over, and and uh, Trevon Diggs another another interception in this one. Uh, and as Troy Aikman pointed out in the telecast, a very Dionish interception in which he kind of baited a uh, deep post throw, and then uh, knew he'd have the catch up speed to run it down and get the get the interception. Yeah, that's been the comparison in vogue right now. Trayvon Diggs to best corner in Dallas since Deion Sanders. But listen, it's hard to argue with his production, and he's really been a difference maker on the defense. It would be hard to play worse than the defense played last season, but certainly there's been an improvement in a lot of areas. Taking the ball away has been one of them, and Diggs has been tremendous. I don't think there's a person on earth who wants to live more in the past than jerry jones and whenever like when you hear a comparison like that on a broadcast you know exactly where it's coming from right and like i remember being down in dallas for uh, a story that i did for the magazine and at the time it was dak prescott and ezekiel elliott and amari cooper and what was everybody saying down there the new triplets the new irvin and aikman and emmett smith and this is a guy that kind of knows how to puppeteer uh you know the fan base and say oh this is the Deion sanders uh you know a uh, Hey, Troy, can you say this on the broadcast, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and it all works out. And uh, it bridges me to my next point, which is it keeps us stuck in the past, which is why uh, we should stop. Because I think you were gaslighting me, Gary, here at the beginning of the segment <laughs> by telling me that this was a matchup that you were looking forward to. And mm. uh, as someone who spent his formative years in the 80s and 90s, that would make sense. But <laughs> I, I don't think that the Giants and Cowboys is a good game anymore. And I think we should stop caring until – Either one of them really give us a, a, a reason to, to give a you know what that that would be that's my overarching take on this. This is no longer the America's game centerpiece of your evening. Gather the kids around the television game. It's just a it's a bad game between two middle of the road franchises. 
I mean, I think we had to confront that a little bit last season too with all of the NFC East teams in prime time, right? And it's they're in prime time because they're teams with large fan bases and big cities and there's the historic ties and, um, you know, it's an easy game to slot into prime time and they're just not prime time worthy in most cases, which last season left us with a lot of bad football that we were watching. LeBron James was at Browns chargers, by the way, they, they could have, they could have gone nuts with that game. He could have been anywhere. He was a Cowboys fan and he chose to go to Browns chargers to see Brandon Staley and Kevin Stefanski dialing it up. Um, you know, I, you know, so the Fox broadcast had the choice to go between 49ers and Cardinals or Cowboys and Giants. And I looked at like the television heat map and it was mm-hmm. like California, Seattle, Northern Idaho, North Dakota, and the North part of Minnesota were the only, uh, places in the country that didn't have to watch Cowboys Giants. And I think that they're better for it. I think that they watched two better football teams and, uh, they didn't have to see Mike Glennon. And even before we knew it was Mike Glenn, <laughs> this still would have been a bad game. You, can, like, you, you can't take that chance. There's a chance yeah, Mike yeah. Glenn was going to see the field. It should be like American Idol, like or instantly we can vote. Like like ten minutes into a game, like you just have your cell phone and you can text one two one two and just be like, "Do you really still want this on your television?" You can say no. no. You can just opt out and then g- give me. Give me tri- give me the number two pick in the draft and a potential MVP front runner over this rivalry that we say is a rivalry that is not NFL rivalries don't really like even exist anymore. This is not a real thing. So number three pick, Connor, because number the two number two pick was playing in a game that also nobody <laughs> really wanted to watch. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that game probably very late in the show. Check out <laughs> check hour three. <laughs> Bears Raiders. Okay, so we're getting into a pretty weird part of the show here. We're going to talk about some uh, some coaches who are embattled for different reasons here. But uh, we're starting out in Vegas where uh, we'll start with the Bears side of this. They go out there. Justin Fields becomes the starter after maybe not being the starter. And I do want to point out, Justin Fields tweaked his knee in the first half, which obviously sent Andy Dalton onto the field. And Andy Dalton was not wearing his rib protector at the time, which I, I've never really heard of. He wasn't dressed. He literally was not prepared to go out on the field when the starting quarterback got hurt. So they, they had a, a mini disaster, but it was averted because their defense just sort of dominated this game. And the bears come away with a very bears ish win. It is a very bears ish win, win, right? There was nothing aesthetically pleasing about it you still come out confused as to the overall direction of the franchise um you know sean desai seems to be doing some good things on the defensive front that seems to be like the thing that they have going for them right now uh but otherwise like uh sort of just like a it's always interesting like you can look at a box score or you can like watch a majority of the game but with the score blanked out with your hand at the bottom of the screen and just think that they're losing and at some point mm. they're just like ahead by two touchdowns. Well, at least we got an extended look at Justin Fields without the awkwardness of him only being the starter until Andy Dalton is healthy. So, at least we saw him have the chance to kind of settle into that role. Speaking of Dalton by the way, did anyone notice that his maybe it's just me, but does his appearance seem to be morphing, you know, the beard growing and maybe becoming more white and gray, similar to how Nate's performance morphs in Ted Lasso a little bit? Mm. Or am I just making this up? In any event. Um, also, I did find it somewhat depressing during the broadcast how they kept referencing how good friends Derek Carr and Khalil Mack are. And they were supposed to be teammates for a long time. Like, this matchup is never... That that aspect of it is never going to be weird when those te- teams play. Never not going to be weird when those teams play each other. Especially given the report that John Gruden tried to get Khalil Mack back. You know, like he had recognized the complete ridiculousness of the error that he made and then tried to rectify the decision. But I remember when they played each other the first time and I, I tracked the game. It was in London. And I wanted to see how many times Gruden double-teamed Khalil Mack in order to prevent him from making a play in that game above 
like, you know, maybe even stuff that was counterintuitive to helping the offense succeed. And on almost every play, Khalil Mack was double or triple teamed in that game because John Gruden did not want him to log any sort of sack or make any sort of difference making play in that game. And I think there will always be like that soreness there, but this team could be so much better than they are right now. And, and that's crazy to think that. And obviously they wouldn't have some of the play, good players that they have now because they wouldn't have had the draft capital. But I think this team would still be stupendous with Amari Cooper and Khalil Mack in the field. Can I ask a really weird question before we get into the Raiders side of this? Why did these two teams play in 2019 and again in 2021? It must be because of the weird schedule. The 17 game expansion. Oh, I was thinking that earlier too. That's why the 17 game, aside from being a terrible idea for player safety, um, just really messes everything up because at least you could count on the every four years, but now everything's thrown into chaos. Hmm. Well, okay. That's no good. And uh, also no good. The Raiders, 3 0 start. They now lost two games in a. uh, uh, in a six-game span, a six-day span, uh, I should say. But uh, look, the the story of the week going into the weekend was John Gruden and his comments about uh, D. Marie Smith that were, uh, I think, racially insensitive is is what you would say at the very least. But uh, I I don't know. I mean, how if you're on this team, how do you react to that? Yeah. And you don't ever want to tie wins and losses to real off-field serious issues. Uh, But if you're a player on the team and the report comes out Friday that your coach said this horrible racist thing and you are then playing a game in two days and he's supposedly leading your team, you could see how you would be feeling weird about giving your all for a team led by this person who made these ugly comments. And I know, um, you know, he made a public apology, although you could say it was a an apology with some strange caveats. And every time he has given the apology, the caveats only grow. And obviously he addressed it with the team. But I think it's fair to expect that for some players on the roster, that there would have been an effect on how much they wanted to play for him on Sunday and thus the outcome of the game. It's interesting, too, because, you know, and again, you don't want to lump in something that's, you know, obviously clearly racial and sens- racially insensitive with, you know, anything that was not that Gruden has done in the past. But he's always been this divisive figure within every team that he's coached. There's never been like a, a, a true, um, you know, like something that you could back with actual, you know, uh, people's opinions, but like... Uh, evidence of him galvanizing a unit, you know, and bringing everybody together. He's always been divisive. He's always played favorites. He's always liked, you know, certain, you know, veteran players over other certain, you know, like scores of people who have played for him will always say this. And so I think there's a big challenge for him now to navigate this minefield in addition to trying to stop a losing streak, all while trying to convince people that you're something that you've never been able to convince them that you are throughout your entire career. And so I think it's it's an interesting sort of pickle that he has himself in. And, uh, you know, again, you don't want to mix the past with the content of the emails, which were appalling, but it's it's one of those things that you wonder, like, okay, how, how, do you, how does he dig himself out of this? Because he's never been a finesse guy on an emotional level. And I think an unfortunate character trait for a coach is not being willing to recognize and overcome shortcomings. And in Gruden's apology, he clearly seemed more bothered that this email had gotten out in the first place from 10 years ago, which, listen, that's a whole worthwhile and separate conversation that why was this the only email from the entire Washington football team investigation into very serious behavior that leaked. But that's that doesn't have any bearing on what Gruden said. And he said those comments and he made the point, oh, I don't have a racist bone in my body. And that's not something that you can say when you've made a racist comment. So I think 
that reflects poorly on his willingness to learn from and grow and address the mistake. And then you also have to wonder the players who are hearing that apology from him, you know, whatever form it took in a private setting, both the public and the private version, how do you take that seriously if they deny being racist when they've clearly made a racist comment? I mean, you know, I think you need to own the mistake fully without a caveat. Here, here. Titans, Jaguars. <laughs> and here comes the robot. Yeah, so, you know, look, we're all on Urban Meyer watch here. Uh, it was a... It was a sloppy performance by the Jaguars. This was not a team that necessarily uh, laid down and died here. The final score was 37-19. Jacksonville was in this game. They uh, they were on the goal line with a chance to cut it to a one-possession game in the fourth quarter and end up getting stuffed. And uh, they were their, usually, you know, their usual erratic selves in this one. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, uh, you shouldn't be making a decision on any head coach after five games. But if you were ever going to make a decision that a head coach was was not qualified to uh, do this job in the NFL after five games, it would probably look a lot like Urban Meyer's for five, first five games in the NFL here. And uh, I'm not quite sure where they go from here in what is becoming just sort of a uh, an almost cartoonishly bad start to the season. Right, but here's why you can make that decision because the Jaguars are reaching this pivot point for the franchise, right? And so next year you have almost $100 million in salary cap space. Your draft equity is going to be phenomenal. And you have people that, players that other teams would want to trade for coming up here at the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. And so right now, like, Urban Meyer has this seat of power still, right? And, you know, he has the GM that he wanted there to work with. And all this stuff that he has that can still direct the future of the franchise. And I think if you're Shad Khan, what you have to worry about now is like, if this is a guy I'm going to fire at the end of the season anyway, why am I going to let him decide, you know, who gets traded, who, you know, what we're going to do with all these picks, you know, all that stuff. I mean, they're coming up on arguably the most pivotal off season in, you know, the recent franchise history where, you're building what Trevor Lawrence is going to have for the next, you know, three or four years. And if you let this guy dictate it, like, it, it just doesn't seem like he's qualified to make any of these decisions. The draft was bad. Um, a lot of the other personnel decisions were bad. He just looks half asleep on the sideline right now. And I, I don't know how, I don't know what's inspiring faith in you at this point to, to keep him on board during a very critical time for the franchise. Yeah, and it seems like the waves calmed a little bit from earlier in the week when both videos of him out in an Ohio bar acting inappropriately with another woman, uh, since those surfaced, the waves seemed to quiet a little bit, but that could very well just be for now. And I think it's very reasonable to expect that Shad Khan will have to make a decision by the end of this first year. Uh, would, would he like to continue with Urban or not? And that's going to include both off-field behavior and on-field results. And one thing that I thought was pretty jarring was that after the game, Urban Meyer said that running a quarterback sneak with Trevor Lawrence is not possible right now, that they haven't practiced that enough to a point where he feels confident running it in a game. Sure, Trevor Lawrence was not under center at Clemson, but I think, you know, We've had a lot of conversations with evaluators around the league for the last few years about how you project players from different co college offenses to the NFL. And one of the things that smart coaches say, I remember hearing this with people who have worked with Patrick Mahomes, is you don't focus on the things that they can't do. You say, if I'm a good enough coach, I can get them to learn this very simple skill like taking a snap from under center. So it is wild and ridiculous to be and perhaps goes back to Gary's point about the lack of preseason snaps or, or the split with Gardner Minshew, who they ended up trading anyway. Maybe it goes back to that. But how do you as a coach not get the number one pick to a point where between the time when you draft him or to be honest, since 
you knew you had the number one overall pick. You knew this was going to be the guy. How do you not get him to a point where he can execute a quarterback sneak in a game by week five? Yeah, I mean, that's it's absolutely terrifying. And there have been college coaches who have come to the NFL with their quirks. Like, for example, uh, I forget what, which the which former player was. It might have been Teddy Bridgewater, right, that said that Matt Rule didn't practice, like, red zone or didn't practice, you know, or it was something like that, like some critical – or like fourth and goal or something like that. Like they didn't have situational practice for a very important part of the game. And that's just something that you don't do in college for whatever reason. And it brings up, but like quarterback sneak is like a really important thing to have in your arsenal. And I understand maybe a lack of willingness to want your quarterback doing that. Um, and like, you know, smashing his head forward for a short distance when he's the future of the franchise. But that said, like, you know, this is part of the game and, you know, you're going to need to do these kind of things. And, you know, I don't know, n- nothing about this seemed uh, right. I mean, the, the sideline just seemed erratic. Like, it just doesn't seem like a coach who has like inspired or, you know, I, I'll use that word again, catalyzed, galvanized, whatever you want to say, the masses to the point where I think it was his second apology last week saying that like, them being prepared to play the Titans was not up to him. It was up to the players. And, you know, I just think like, these are all very interesting, like who's driving the ship comments here by the head coach. And they played like that today. I don't want to draw too large a conclusion off of that ill-fated challenge flag that he threw. That was literally the most excited. Oh, I think any of us have seen the Jaguar sideline all season. That was Uh, part of me was like, okay, that's kind of like the equivalent of like the college basketball coach, like picking up the technical foul and like in in defense of his player or something like that. But I've never really seen that on the NFL level because generally what you get is if you're a player, you know, like you see with receivers all the time, it's like, oh, I caught that. I caught that. I caught that. And, you know, you either hear from the booth that, you know, no, he didn't. So don't throw the flag. Or if you actually convince the coach to throw the flag and then it turns out you don't that that you didn't catch it then you're then you got to explain yourself then you're you, you get called into the principal's office or whatever but uh yeah it was a wild scene it went on for seemingly i don't know I, like more than a minute right yeah like it yeah. was just going on and on and it just seemed like everyone it was like price is right or something like everyone was just shouting at him to do something and then he finally kind of like shrugged his shoulder and sort of like very awkwardly tossed the flag out and it's like you just threw away a timeout in the second half of the game that you're trailing by two possessions uh but i don't know all, all the players were all excited it was just kind of like I, what's, I don't know. It's like your kids are yelling that they want ice cream for dinner. And after a while, you're like, all right, you can have ice cream for dinner. And <laughs> it's like, no, you're not supposed to do that. That's not the way this works. And it was like know. holding the flag out in his hand. <laughs> and weird. it was almost like, oh, you want me to do it? You want me to do it? Like asking them to like egg him on. Like it reminded me of some like dynamic among high schoolers or something where they're like, yeah, you won't do it. You won't do it. You want me to do it? You want me to do it? It was, it was so strange. It was like it was like he was watching, like it was like he was watching TV, but like and not the game. And then something like just all these people were screaming at him and just being like, "Hey, like there's something going on that requires your attention." And it was like a, like it was almost like in those movies where like that that slow motion like <laughs> war scene where like all the noise fades out and then you realize like you're in the middle of something kind of sticky. Like that was what it's Urban Meyer seemed like he was going through. I've just never seen, you know, okay. We've seen Tom Coughlin struggle to get a check or Jeff Fisher struggle to get the challenge flag out of his parka and uh, that gigantic parka and like Tom Coughlin, like lost the flag once. Okay. Like th- that's different than like not being dialed in and like, just like who, who, who are you talking to on your headset? Who's telling you whether or not to challenge it? Like I would, I'm fascinated to know like what all the mechanisms he has in place are because th- they're not operating at NFL speed right now. It was it was wild, and I guess that was the most shocking part of the conclusion is, and, and, and like you said, Connor, we've seen guys like you know physically getting the challenge flag struggle with that, or you see you know like a team's rushing up to the line of scrimmage and and you sort of like thrown in a panic because you can't see a replay stuff like that. There was so much time to go through everything you need to see and see that there was no chance you were you were winning the challenge and it was just like okay this is gonna end with him putting it back in his pocket but then he threw it at the end like against all information to the contrary he just 
yeah, I don't know. It was just you, you got to make the people happy sometimes, I guess. I just watched it again. And he like, <laughs> he's squinting and looking at the replay on the scoreboard. It's like you have someone in your headset who should be telling you whether to challenge this. And also you have like coaches next to you screaming at the top of your lungs and you're squinting at the scoreboard, which – I, were they at TIA Bank or were they in Nashville? It, if they were in, uh, were they, no, in, they was, were in Jacksonville. That was in Jacksonville. It's a yeah. very nice, very new scoreboard which, or uh, jumbotron, which I may add, which is very large in 4K and very you know state of the art. But he's just like, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> like, it, it's like, what, what is going on here? There's a lot made out of the college to NFL transition. And the fact that it often goes poorly, but I think very rarely have we seen a college coach get to the NFL and so quickly seem completely out of his depth. And I think the only explanation for it is arrogance, that he felt like this would be a cinch, that he won a lot in college. Why can't I win a lot in the NFL? And he looks a lot like somebody who didn't do the necessary preparation to be prepared for this job, to be ready to develop Trevor Lawrence, um, to make this into a successful football team. And that's at the end of the day, like to put an entire bow on this and bring it back to what Gary said at the top, that at the end of the day is how, why you can make a decision five games into a season. You know what I mean? Like our franchise quarterback is in bad shape. This guy is not doing anything to help that. What is going on here? Like, why aren't we, you know, why aren't we doing the simplest things on earth to be able to, move this thing forward we're not like maybe the idea was that we were going to reinvent the wheel and do things differently or interestingly but that is not the case it's not what's happening broncos Steelers. so yeah i'm not gonna totally uh hop back on the Steelers bandwagon here and start driving it toward uh sofi stadium for for second week in february but this was their offensive line's best performance since 2019. It was the first time, really, in the last two seasons, it looked like a NFL caliber offensive line, and they got a result out of it. They got a lead in this game. They got a, a deep ball early to Deontay Johnson that Ben Roethlisberger threw very nicely with his very own arm. And, uh, yeah, it just... This was how they wanted to win games. This is what they wanted the offense to look like. Uh, ben only drops back 26 times in this one, and they, they get a good win over a quality opponent, and everything is right in Pittsburgh again. Yeah, Gary, that's exactly what the key was to their whole plan this season. They wanted to be able to run the ball. They drafted a running back in the first round. They wanted to get the final gasps of Ben Roethlisberger's career. To do both of those things, you need a competent offensive line. So today we saw that the offensive line was playing better. And then as a result, the offense played better and the team got a win. It was so interesting that, I mean, this uh, Broncos secondary is so good. And, uh, you know, especially early, like watching Ben Roethlisberger test them a little bit with like these outbreaking throws that like, that just left his arm like, like just like a heave of like dry heat. And it's just like, Ooh, you know, um, I don't know if anybody has ever seen the movie angels in the outfield, but um, the end of the movie, Tony Danza's character, Mel Clark throws this dis decisive pitch and it's in slow motion. It's the nineties, but like, so his arm is going so slow and he's making this like weird noise, like a pitcher. I don't imagine making, but like, a, and like, that's what all of these outbreaking throws looked like. And like the Broncos corners were so close to jumping all these. And I still don't understand. Um, I got to see in high school physics, but how the arrival time of the ball to the defender did not coincide with like four picks today. But that said, it's, it, it worked. And uh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing when that happens. Patriots, Texans. So this one was, uh, boy, this was fascinating for a while. <laughs> this is Tim Kelly, like, just dug into his bag of tricks, uh, came up with, you know, flea flicker touchdown. Chris Moore, who was just activated from, from the practice squad, I think most recently of the Baltimore Ravens, uh, ended up just eating up this Patriots secondary. Uh, there was at one point, what was that one drive count? That was, that was 18 plays over 10 minutes yeah. to start the game. 
for uh, for the Texans. Touchdown drive to open this up. Uh, I mean, look, this is uh, this is the worst roster in football, <laughs> and I mean they were uh, they were in control of this game until they got a little bit sloppy in the second half. Yeah, I, I can't, I could not believe what I was seeing. And it's a strange feeling when, like, you just take for granted that everything Bill Belichick does usually has a larger reason and he's right about all these things and, and you're wrong. And, and that's probably still the case. But, like, when you trade, Ste- you know, Stephen Gilmore this week for some reason in particular, and then, you know, you, his backup get, you know, some of the guys behind him on the roster get hurt and you're left with a secondary that's so depleted that, a practice squad receiver from the Ravens who needed receivers worse than anybody in the NFL is torching you. Um, And Davis Mills, you know, is, is torching you. And, you know, it it just, um, it didn't make sense. It was all very strange. And just the hallmarks of a typical Belichick team. Now I understand that there were injuries and their offensive line was banged up. There were fumbling issues, all that kind of stuff with the Patriots. But, you know, the hallmarks of your team, right? Like toughness at the line of scrimmage, uh, great secondary play just went completely out the window against, as you said, like the worst roster in football and the tight, the Texans credit where credit is due. They have outplayed our expectations to this point. Um, Tim Kelly is, is coaching, a, is, is coaching a good season. He's having a good year as their offensive coordinator. Other than that, this team should be losing by 35 points every week. And new England, especially should have picked them apart uh, when it's a, a week where you're rebounding from an emotional game. Like I, I don't see any reason why they should have laid down like they did in this one. Yeah. You wonder if there was a carryover, even though last week's game was a loss, they played the Buccaneers so tight. It was uh, emotional with Tom Brady returning to Foxborough. And you wonder if you had the same kind of emotional letdown that you would after a big win. Um, but the other thing, and you referenced it briefly, Connor, is that ball security has just really been an issue for the Patriots all season. The running backs have fumbled in key moments. We saw it week one. Uh, we saw a big fumble on the goal line this week. It's been uncharacteristic of the Patriots who, the, you know, a hallmark of Patriots teams has always been they make so few mistakes. And this year, the reason that the Patriots are two and three and had a tough time in Houston unexpectedly today is they were making mistakes. And I, you know, I didn't expect to see that, I guess, from the Patriots. And I think that's probably why their performance, one of the reasons why their performance has been below what we expected this year. Yeah, another big running back fumble. Uh, Damian Harris this time when he's going into the end zone. Terrence Mitchell ends up punching out. Nice play by Terrence Mitchell, but uh, there have been a lot of, you know, we saw J.J. Taylor last week lost a fumble. We know Damian Harris basically lost the the game-clinching fumble in the opening uh, game. It's it's a weird, I don't think you can put a trend, uh, you know, say like, what a worrisome trend, these running back fumbles, but it's they they've just been happening a lot, and that's a really weird thing. Uh, to go down here the the other to me the 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 super weirdest thing about what was a really strange game was the Texans are totally one of those teams where it's like you know like oh you know we don't have great offense we don't have a great defense but like we're gonna win special teams every week and they didn't get beat on special teams but they made just a just a comedy of special teams errors uh that you know they, they missed two pats they they had to burn a timeout before trying a 56-yard field goal in the fourth quarter and then missed it anyway. But they also ran this, and I will admit, I thought it was a neat little wrinkle. Uh, They lined up for a punt, and then they sort of moved into, you know, Cameron Johnson, their punter, moved on, you know, toward the center, and it looked like they were going to run a fake punt, and then they backed out of that. But because they moved up, uh, basically, uh, you know, the Patriots return man had abandoned his post in order to prepare for the fake punt. So it looked like Cameron Johnson was going to back up for a short snap, like a 10-yard snap instead of the usual 15, and kick it, and it was just going to roll forever. And it was going to be like this awesome moment where it's like, oh, 50 yards in the air, but 80-yard net. And uh, instead, Cameron Johnson took the short snap and just drilled the punt into the back of a teammate's helmet and it bounced out of bounds for a for a zero yard net. But uh, yeah, I do, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that let the Patriots back into this game. I don't know if they win that game without all these Texans special teams mistakes just sort of popping up in this one. It was reminiscent of the 
play earlier in the day when Zach Wilson threw a pass that hit a lineman uh, off the lineman's back. Uh, different play, obviously, but just a lot of loose footballs hitting teammates in the back and ultimately resulting in a bad play. You got to you gotta watch yourself if you're a lineman. Someone's always trying to peg you in the back with something. Credit where credit's due here for Houston, though. I mean, Davis Mills played a good game, and I think that the one thing that we thought about with the Texans going into this season is if they could come out of it, um, either sure that Tyrod Taylor could do another season as their starting quarterback, which I think he absolutely could, or that Davis Mills is at least someone who, depending on where your draft equity is after this year, you could maybe still consider as a guy who would compete for the job next year. I think you did okay given the circumstances that you were put into, especially with the the, the draft stock that they were left after the the Bill O'Brien era. And so I think it was interesting. I mean, D- Davis Mills seemed comfortable. He seemed like he was moving around really well. There's all that talk about, you know, how Bill Belichick wrecks rookie quarterbacks. And I thought out of anybody, he would uh, destroy Davis Mills. But at the same time, I mean, he, he had a good game. I mean, he played, he played well. He was making plays on the move. Like he, he looked, uh, he looked a lot less stationary, I think, than I, I thought he was initially too. Packers Bengals. Boy, special teams mistakes. We had lots of them in this one. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure where to start. I think the Bengals were, were I mean, very obviously game in this one. They, they force a, an overtime game here with the Packers, uh, a game that, you know, a year ago, I think everyone would just expect them to get blown out. So uh, positive things for the Bengals, positive things for the Packers uh, surviving this game, but just a, a wild run of missed field goals toward the end of this one that uh, ends with a Mason Crosby 49 yarder. Uh, it was just a really weird game. And what do you do if you're Matt LaFleur, right? Uh, why did you keep making <laughs> poor Mason Crosby kick these <laughs> field goals? Like, you know, you were in the, in the fourth quarter, uh, you, you, you were gifted the ball at like the Bengals 17, you know, and you could have played for, the win you could have played for the touchdown or i'm sorry it was right at the beginning of overtime or the fourth quarter um the, the, interception. the interception yes the overtime. yeah beginning of overtime, overtime. Yep. yep and so you have the ball on the Bengals 17 and you just do the two surrender runs and then you kick on third down and i feel like a lot of times like matt lafleur i mean he's great i mean he won 26 games in his first two seasons he's gonna have the team he's gonna win the division for the third straight year this year but like there are strange moments when he takes the ball out of the hands of the best player in the NFL. And I feel like if you were to entrust Aaron Rodgers to get you 10 yards or 17 yards in that situation, he probably could have gotten you 17 yards. You know, you just say, listen, Mason missed the last two kicks. We're, we're going to address that during the week, but can you just go down and let's, let's end this thing. And I feel like that, that would have not been a problem for him. Yeah, Connor, I thought you made a smart point in the post-game column you wrote saying exactly that. And certainly that was an unusual sequence of calls there. They were certainly seeming like they were just going to settle for the field goal, despite the fact that he was just coming off another miss. Um, And I understand the logic behind kicking on third down in case there's a bad snap or something along those lines. But why not just keep trying to get the first down given that the kicker has just missed. So I found that a little bit strange as well. All right, guys, five games to go. Let's go to the lightning-ish round. Eagles, Panthers. So kudos to the Eagles for winning this game. Uh, they trailed throughout and it just seemed like the Panthers were in control. The defense was really good. The run game was really good. The really disconcerting thing for the Panthers, as would be with any team uh, in, in this position, is uh, Sam Darnold looked a lot like Jets' Sam Darnold in this game. This was, uh, this was, oh, this was worrisome what went on because he had been really sharp for the first four games. Another back-breaking turnover late in the game. And, you know, early in the year, the Panthers were surprising because Sam Darnold's play was surprising. This was a matchup of two teams that are still probably looking for their franchise quarterback and are going with the guy they have this year to evaluate and see Sam Darnold, Jalen Hurts. And I think a performance like this uh, erases a lot of the good things that Darnold did early in the season. Yeah, it was fascinating to see him take a snap and to uh, 
you know, and, and to roll out to one side and like, you know, maybe the coverage isn't exactly what he expected or that one on schedule throw that Joe Brady kind of always has that like that you can make no matter what that's covered up. And all of a sudden he's forced to kind of look at read two, look at read three, get down the field. And he's having a hard time doing that. And I thought it was really interesting because that's to Gary's point, what we said about the jets was like, and, and, uh, and the Eagles, I think did some fascinating things. I mean, they just, uh, this was not a team that you thought would have brought, you know, especially with their roster right now, just this, Great a defensive game plan some of the underneath you know zone stuff that they were bringing you know when darnell had some open receivers there was just tremendous and i think uh, it showed um like a clear a clear understanding of what he's historically been comfortable with uh, uncomfortable with uh, regardless of the scheme in the nfl and so i thought it was um i thought it was really instructive and if you're carolina you probably do freak out a little bit right i mean you know i think it makes you a little bit nervous and it makes you wonder if okay, like, you know, do, how do we change this? Because it's not like you have Teddy Bridgewater anymore. It's not like you have a quarterback like that where you can lean on. You have Sam Darnold, who still, for a lot of intents and purposes, is, is basically a rookie. Dolphins Buccaneers. So, yeah, the Bucks just sort of ran away with this one. Uh, it, it was sort of a game after the first quarter, and then uh, Tom Brady was, you know, they, they just took over. They had their almost full complement of weapons, but even without Rob Gronkowski, this is uh, this is just a, a handful to deal with here, even for a Dolphins team that has been pretty good defensively of late and uh, just, just not in this one. But, uh, yeah, Miami has suddenly just a... Boy, a whole lot of issues as they get ready to head over to London and play the Jaguars. When the Dolphins briefly had a first quarter lead, I was ready for Gary's I was right on Jacoby Reset. This is the key to the future of the franchise. It was all teed up for you, Gary, if the game had ended at that point. <laughs> if they had called it after 15 minutes. Jacoby Reset was still... Uh, he's not the future of the franchise, but he's still. I, I I don't understand how anyone could watch his tape and to his tape and and say that Brissett has not been markedly uh, in upgrade at this point. Even if you want to argue based on his draft status that Tua has the higher ceiling, because I think if you're making that argument, the only thing you're basing it on is the fact that Tua was drafted very high. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Well, we'll see what they do next week. Brissett was playing on one leg this week. He had the hamstring injury and. Uh, he gutted it out, and he played really well. But uh, if your defense can give up 45 points, that's the way it goes. And that is my uh, session to yell about Jacoby Brissett. Truly sort of a Jack Youngblood moment for Jacoby Brissett this week, Gary. Definitely agreed that the, the heroics were on par with that, or maybe like the Michael Jordan uh, flu game. But, uh, <laughs> flu game. <laughs> the flu game, yeah. But um I, I don't know. I mean, I agree with you somewhat. I mean, you know, there was uh, some dropped touchdown passes. You know, there were some weird kind of like doinks at the beginning of this game that I feel like, uh, you know, I think Jalen Waddle had a touchdown pass that was dropped and, uh, um, you know, and they had to settle for a field goal. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, what I find weird about this team in general is that I thought that at least defensively they would be able to contend with the Buccaneers, given Brian mm. Flores' expertise, given the the capital they've thrown at the defense in particular. If you're a bad offensive team, you're a bad offensive team. There's nothing you can do about that. But uh, I, I think especially after the Patriots hung with them so close the week before, um, you could absorb the best of that game plan. And I was just surprised that I think it was so um, lopsided, as, as lopsided as it was. Lions, Vikings. So how about those feisty Detroit Lions sticking around just in time to win another heartbreak or excuse me, lose another heartbreaking game on a walk off kick? Uh, I don't know. This was one I, I like I had an eye on it, but uh, it was, I was constantly sort of like my tension was drifting and it's like the Vikings were up 10 with four minutes to go. And it's like, all right, this is this is not going to work out. And uh, all of a sudden there they were leading with 37 seconds left only to have a uh, Kirk Cousins put together driver and Kirk Cousins, by the way, he's had to do that a couple of times this year and he's done it. Like he's had four opportunities where he had to mount a late drive to either win the game or force overtime. And he has uh, successfully done that three times at this point, which is, uh, you know, good for Kirk. Yeah. And Dan Campbell was emotional after the loss, which is understandable. Uh, this is two really 
last second field goal, long field goal losses that they've had this season. And, you know, you mentioned er earlier that the Texans have the worst roster in the NFL. I think the Lions probably give them a run for their money in that department. So the fact that they are challenging teams that are built much better right now um, is, is pretty impressive. And obviously they're not going to be good this year, but I am interested to see the direction that the staff can take the team in the future. Here's, here's another, like to tie it back to the Urban Meyer point. If you want to look at what a team looks like, an 0-5 team looks like that you, gives you hope, right? That that things are going to work out eventually. It's the Lions. If you want to know and fight, like if you're Shad Khan, just watch the, the two of these teams. Watch how they behave at the end of games, and I feel like it's uh, the the difference is very clear to see. Boy, two zero and five coaches, and there's just no justice in the world. <laughs> Saints, Washington. So the Saints, uh, they kind of do it with defense. They kind of do it on on weird big plays here. They got a Hail Mary at the end of the first half. They got a long touchdown on a blown coverage. Uh, boy, blown coverage is becoming a, a thing for Jack Del Rio's defense here. But uh, that's how they go into Washington and end up uh, taking this game here. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just... I don't know how to really feel about either of these teams because I, I think the Saints offense is sort of, you're seeing it. They're just flawed. They're limited at this point. And on the other side of it, we knew that Washington was limited offensively, but this dominant defense is just giving up 30 points every week. Yeah, we got sort of a complete smorgasbord of what Jameis Winston can do. <laughs> between turning the ball over and then the long touchdowns. Um, I agree yeah. with you, Gary. I think that the offense ultimately will hold the team back, and that's the reason they've had an up-and-down season so far. It's Can the defense do enough to support that, or can't they in games? And also agree with you that the Washington defense has really been a disappointment so far this year. Who else would have put their money on Jameis Winston being the first quarterback to complete a Hail Mary this season, right? I mean, that's just that was just so money. Um, and I do think he's surrounded with some pretty good skill position players, and that's just what's bizarre about the Saints this year is, like, they can blow out the Packers by 35 points. They're going to come and they're going to lose to really bad teams, and they're going to – uh, they're going to be a complete enigma for the remainder of the season. But I think that's going to be a very fun uh, and enjoyable part about that team. And, you know, uh, they're kind of like a powder keg in that division right now. Jets, Falcons. And we will end our show where the day began on Sunday with the Sunday morning game. I hate the Sunday morning game. I have no problem. I, I have I have less of a problem with them playing in London. I, I people from London have said it's a really nice thing, and and I want to respect that. But just play it in the regular window. It's like it's what six o'clock local time. If if you put them in that early window, just do it then, and just do like normal body clock, and and just let's live our lives like normal football playing and watching humans, and and just have a normal kickoff. But anyways, Falcons, I will say the Falcons look good in this game relative to their opponent. I think you would have, you know, a lot of people would have argued these are probably two pretty evenly matched teams. The Falcons were better. They were clearly the better team in this one. And uh, they just let the Jets hang around with some uh, some turnovers. Kyle Pitts breakout game, which I think that was exciting to see. And perhaps the um, vision for this offense is coming to fruition um, obviously when Arthur Smith brought the outside zone to Atlanta, we all envisioned Cordero Patterson playing all important <laughs> positions and basically gaining all the yards. I mean, this is how you draw it up, obviously. Um, but, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it was a nice win for Atlanta, awful uniforms, but, um, one, mm -hmm. I think fun thing to see afterwards that I just noted, and I don't know why, but Matt Ryan was like on fire on the sidelines after this game. Uh, I, I like saw him like uh, mouth the words. That's what I'm effing talking about. And he's like doing really hard high fives that I think were less enjoyable and probably more painful for everybody else. <laughs> you're a quarterback. I hope you're doing that. You're not throwing it by the way. And, uh, um, and so I, but it was good to see him like that invested. Like, I feel like Matt Ryan has kind of been like apathetic in some way uh, after all this, like, you know, weirdness and lack of success and, and poor roster building. And it's, it's good to see him just like back in, in, in the game a little bit. 
Yeah, I think you're right in that we are starting to see the vision come together a little bit. It was a really slow start to the year for the Falcons, but maybe they're starting to turn the corner. As for the Jets, big issue for Zach Wilson was ball placement. His throws just seemed to be off. Um, we talked earlier about Justin Herbert having a you know, an ability perhaps beyond his years to put the ball where exactly where it needs to be. And conversely, that was really where Zach Wilson struggled against the Falcons. A weird thing too. I mean, like that was always something like even back to training camp, you would watch that. And even in the, in the drills where he's not going against anybody or like, sometimes the receivers have to turn backwards a lot to get these balls or like, you know, this drill should be going really quickly and it's not. And it was interesting that like, Sometimes he makes those throws seamlessly and everything looks really beautiful, but then like there's a lot of times it doesn't. And uh, that's, uh, that's been really, uh, that's been really like a fascinating thing to kind of throw on the radar for him this year. Yeah. The routine has been difficult for him. Yes. Right. And you know, I get, I get it that your offense is supposed to create these big sweeping boot action plays where he's going to have the time to, look downfield like he did at BYU and make the great throws that accentuate the arm talent. But if you can't get the on schedule stuff down, then the rest of this doesn't make any sense. Like nothing works. And so I, I'm, I'm like uh, kind of really interested to see where that goes from here. I feel like all those things could also apply to our podcast at this point. Sometimes the routine is difficult for us. Got to get the on schedule stuff down or this is just not going to work. I think it's working hey, really well, guys. I think Me so. Too. I mean, that, that that big old handsome robot. I mean, that just added a whole different dimension to the show this yeah. week. I mean, yeah. just you know, if I'm sitting there at home having listened to that, I feel pretty good about the direction that this podcast is going. You know, like the Falcons, things are really coming together. And producer Shelby is our Cordero Patterson. Yes, the finest compliment anyone could be paid. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. The MMQB Monday Morning NFL Podcast is Jenny Brentis, Connor Orr, and me, Gary Gremling. We are produced by Shelby Royston. As I's executive producer of podcasts is Scott Brody. And thanks, as always, to senior podcast producer Dan Bloom, who listens to every word of every show. Mark Moravik is emeritus editor of the MMQB, and Andy Benoit is the founder of the MMQB NFL Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to this feed on Apple Podcasts, and once you do, please leave a rating and review because it really does help other people find the show, which is also available on Spotify, Stitcher, SI.com, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. (laughs) 